the way people make movies now is they come up with an idea, they do pre-production, they shoot for a few months, they edit for six months, and then they you know, have discussions about which composer they should call. Then they call the composer, and during the three months the composer's working, they keep re-editing the movie. In the case of Punch Drunk, we were talking about how the theme should be integrated within the movie. We were working on it before they started shooting the movie. We had some pieces of music recorded in a sort of long form before the movie uh, that he could edit to. Then there were things written on top of that. Then there were things written to the completed movie. It was a completely integrated process, and that's why I think, you know, uh, in this case, the music feels so integrated, because it is. Good morning. Hey, what's with all this pudding? What is this? Oh, that's part of a pretty amazing airline promotional giveaway. That's really tremendous. I'm going to start... Punch Drunk Love, I think there were a lot of ideas going on musically on both our parts. We knew we wanted a melody of a certain amount of notes, and we knew what that represented to us. We looked for that over time. I wanted something that could sound fairly random the first few times you heard it, but once chords were added, it would actually be melodious. We talked about harmoniums. I think the first time it came up, I probably lit up like a Christmas tree, like going, why are you asking me about harmoniums? <laughs> one of the ones in the movie is one I found in a music shop in Boston many years before. I asked every music store in town if they had a harmonium, and finally one guy came out <laughs> and said, oh, I got something in the back. It folds up. It's kind of weird. I'm like, sure, well, let me take a look at it. He said, the bellows are ripped on it. And I said, well, maybe I can figure out how to fix that. I looked at the rip on the bellows, and I just took a chance and went and got some duct tape and taped the thing up. And lo and behold, suddenly I had a working harmonium and it was off on tour. So, you know, I remember telling Paul this story. Paul has lots of things on any given movie going through his head about what things represent. I remember telling Paul, I said, oh, there's a funny sound these things make when you first open them up. What happens is the bellows take an air it's like a first breath, sort of like the thing coming alive. It's an example of Paul being able to see a living analogy, make use of a living analogy. I'd go visit the set, see Adam play it, find out what was a natural melody for him to play, then that influenced how I was writing. So he had heard something with harmonium on it, I think, when he was writing. Here's another thing that I think is very classically Paul to me. He will investigate everything. Anything that inspires him, he will investigate. He will learn about. He will use it in the process. The hilarity is, you know, I walk into this thing going, oh my God, I'm gonna get to do a film score with harmonium. I mean, it's been one of my favorite instruments since I was a kid. I got introduced to it as a kid and loved it. Just loved it. There's no harmonium in the score. Adam plays it. That was the sound the object he'd occasionally walk over to would make. But the soundtrack was also made so that whenever Adam was playing those notes, it would have an integration with the world of the soundtrack. So here we go. Right around the time he was starting shooting, he asked me, could you make some pieces for me 
that are just rhythm? And I said, yeah, of course. He said, yeah, I found that when I'm doing long tracking shots, I often have like headphones and he put on a piece of music when he'd set up a shot. Because even if the music wasn't going to be there in the end, it helped give a sense of rhythm. It helped give a sense of sort of poetic pacing to the shot. And I was like, wow, that's really smart and really interesting. And he said, yeah, I've, I've been doing it for a while. So I'm just wondering if maybe you could make a thing that was rhythms. I was really psyched because I said, well, this is great. Here's another area where we could have true integration because if you're doing something to a rhythm i have the actual tempo of the thing and you're actually doing the scenes and the tempos inherent in what's being shot and then i could even write full orchestra music over it or not there any number of things could be done i said well what kind of rhythm and he started singing one to me he started going like so I was like, wait, <laughs> ran to my jacket. And I got my micro cassette recorder, and he sang this little waltz rhythm. I'm like, I said, just, just keep doing that. I said, give me a couple others. He's like, well, I'm thinking like a. And I just held the thing up to him. And he even said, sometimes it should even like a and stop. <laughs> like, I'm trying to stifle myself from laughing while he's doing this because it's great, not because it's funny. I'm like just having a fantastic time. I think I made two or three 10 minute pieces to all the different rhythms he sang to me. And what I do is I do a track of treated piano, do another track of treated piano. I think maybe did five or six, which are layered on top of each other. Um, there's the sound of duct tape opening up in the score, because not just because I remembered our conversation and that he was putting that in the movie. I then was using the duct tape on the piano to get different sounds. And then I went over to the drums in the room and sort of played percussion ensemble. Another beautiful oddity in this movie is how mundane the warehouse is, and yet, you know, Paul's sense of setup and color is imbuing this thing with something else. To me, it's one of the hallmarks of this movie. You're combining this mundane thing with this sort of technicolor aspect. He was working on one of the scenes, I think, with Adam by himself. And he said they had been working on it for a while and not getting it right. At some point, he invited Adam over to watch it playback. And he told me he put the headphones on, said, no, 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 this is what's going to be playing. And showed him how it actually looked, how the colors came off, the sound of those percussion ensemble pieces. And he said, it was great. He said, because Adam suddenly said, oh, I could actually do less. This, this is bull crap to me. No, 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 no. Paul had been watching old MGM musicals. He was studying saturation color of a certain era of movies. And we were talking about some of the feeling we wanted to evoke, which was a feeling of that era, a certain sort of 50s thing. And we were <laughs> out on the street in front of the pre-production office one day talking. And I suddenly got struck, and I was like, I think what you actually want is the thing to feel like a musical, but nobody ever breaks into song. And he went, exactly. And I was sort of jumping up and down going, I, I can get behind that. So I'll just see you at the restaurant? OK.
we have this treated piano percussion ensemble stuff, which is the furthest thing from what anybody was doing soundtrack-wise. And on the orchestra stuff, instead of doing typical of current movie stuff, the orchestra stuff could actually be very old stylistically. We even went and, you know, found old 50s microphones in the studio because he wasn't, you know, happy with one of the first sessions. And I kind of got stuff they would have used at the time, and suddenly it was a little more appropriate. Oh, wow. Okay. You have something mundane like supermarket, but somehow superimposed in there is an old movie signifier of our protagonist is happy and there's a love interest and they're dancing around the supermarket and who in real life doesn't know some version of that feeling. Um, but it's not literal to, you know, singing in the rain. We've not got a song and dance man. We've got a guy trying to buy pudding to get frequent flyer miles who's just sort of happy and moving about. And there is music, and that is, in one sense, an unreal thing. But it's not literally choreographed. You're back to that feeling of a musical. That, that moment in the movie, to me, uh, more than any other, ended up expressing that concept. Barry, I'll be online. Okay, I'm coming. Okay. Paul told me about Jeremy Blake before the movie. He had gone to an exhibition and seen it and was knocked out. He immediately was interested in integrating it. He already had some notions about color and was doing experiments on all sorts of things. Types of film stock, still available, lenses, you name it. He did all his own private experiments to try and get what he was looking for. During those last few months of post, we were all actually in one building. What's this? Paul and Leslie Jones were in one office and Two doors down, uh, Jonathan Carp, the music editor, and I were in our office. And across from the kitchen, Jeremy was in another office. And we were all doing theme and variations, really. I mean, each of us in our own way. And as things started integrating, um, you know, I knew Jeremy's artwork was going to be used in fading between scenes watching what type of layering he was doing how one thing would fade into the next i'd talk to paul and go so there are really cool and easy ways we could make the sound analogous all of these things influenced each other the overture you get some of the ladies gay playing you get some of Shelley Duvall and Popeye, you get not only like orchestra warming up, but you get some of the orchestral theme. The colors Jeremy has going are fading. One image is fading into the next. Well, underneath, sonically, the exact same thing is going on, except that it has this conceptual idea of here are even the sound design components. Like literally, there's a little bit of everything that makes up the music and the sound design, and also these pieces that do have a specific sense of place in the movie. Thank you. We knew we wanted to have this five-note theme represented in various ways. I recorded many different instruments and sounds, and I made a, what I called a palette for him and Leslie Jones to have in the editing bay. Basically, it was a very large library of 
sounds I had recorded or individual instruments. Sometimes it was the theme. Sometimes it was just something that modally would work. And they were divided up. Like, uh, essentially, it would say, you know, if you're using this piece of music, any of these things I'm giving you will work on top of it. So if there was a bed of the percussion thing, here's a type of sound you can put absolutely anywhere. And we even recorded individual orchestra things that could do that. So they had a giant pile of pre-made things, which all were part of the soundscape. We wanted to blur the line between soundtrack and sound design. That there's eight minutes in the front of quote unquote no music before an overture, it's just because that's what was right for this piece. But the front isn't free of soundtrack because from the very first moments, there's stuff I recorded and gave to Paul that were more like sound effects. And the way he sets up the seeming silence before that, how quietly everything's mixed. And the accidental sounds are just strange, and there's a lot of space between them. So when that truck comes by, you know, it does alarm you. Immediately, when he's running off with harmonium, there are actually clusters of sounds and bell sounds, and actually the theme is embedded in that. He had the two favorite pieces he had used during shooting, and he had started, I believe, editing, and he came to me, he said, those worked great, they're gonna cover a lot of territory, but I need one more that's percussive. My friend Matt Chamberlain, great drummer, told me about the Ali Akbar School of Music, which was a place that taught sitar and tabla drum. They had these little boxes for sitar players to practice to and one made tabla drum rhythms, like a rhythm drum, and another was a tambora drone, which basically is a forever, so you can play over top. Step by and say hello. It's terrific. What's doing? So you're going tonight, right? Yeah. I showed Paul some of the different rhythms, and we picked one together and sort of set the tempo, and we just kind of messed with it until the basic so, what's wrong with looking at you? It's a free country. I just feel like I would be a little tense, and I don't think I'd act like myself. No, that's kind of your fault. A song written for a movie, most directors would go, well, it's already in a movie, I can't use it. He needs me, he needs me. The use of He Needs Me, which is originally from the Popeye movie, is an example of what Paul's gift is. Hello. Hello? Is Lena there? Yeah, the wrong room. He and I both love Harry Nilsson's records. Paul, obviously, an Altman fan. I don't know how early he had that in his head. It was not anything we had to discuss. It was already part of the DNA of the project. His initial version was just the song cut three times in a row, a complete repeat. The vocal was going the whole time. Hello. Lena. Yeah. Hi, this is Larry Egan. Somebody working for Paul found out how to get the original master tapes in case we wanted to have the vocal off. And we made a version where the song played once and then the vocal came in and out. Paul actually hated that. And again, this is to Paul's credit. Because I remember going, is there not enough color change? Should 
should the vocal go away a little bit more than it does? And he went, no, this is part of what's great and part of why it works. He needs me, 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 he needs me. But I had done some experiments where we had the uh, original master tapes. We basically, on one of our orchestra sessions, did a takedown of exactly how Shelley Duvall phrased the melody. And we had it played on different instruments. So like the palette I made for him on my stuff, I made a palette where if the vocal went away, we could have full orchestra playing on top of the original recording or an individual instrument soloing. This maybe ended up in the end credits, a version where it's going through all these different variations that we didn't really use that much in the center of the movie. I grew up a big silent movie fan. So when I first started scoring, especially writing on piano, I had a reference. Heart Eight, in the case of Paul, Michael Penn, and I, was all of our first film. There was a lot of uh, both feeling around in the dark and just having fun with it. And it was intriguing, you know? That was my first chance to play music while looking at visual images. During the making of it, talking to Paul, he was sort of asking me, he's like, well, you know, if you, you know, wanted to do film scores or whatever. And I told him, well, not necessarily. My main interest would be working with orchestras. The first time you write for orchestra, it is daunting. I've got to learn that hey, this is an instrument like any other. You know, it may have 80 heads, <laughs> but, you know, most of my life is spent in the recording studio with a large instrument collection, and each instrument has a different function, and the recombining of these things is the fun, and I've spent my whole life doing that. At some point, when you just see it as a giant color machine, musically, you are in a better position to do a good job. There are tons of musical people capable of bringing new and interesting things to this job. Paul and I are both gigantic John Williams fans. I mean, I actually think that guy's underrated. Danny Elfman's great. He does, you know, fantastic work. Uh, Johnny Greenwood does fantastic work. There are lots of people doing good things, but it comes down to the director's follow through. If you hear a movie and the music seems typical, often it's not the composer. Something's probably been flattened, like most movies we're seeing. Help me! Paul has an incredible sense of music. He is incredible at placing stuff. He is incredible at understanding how the music will subconsciously affect people and Always, always, there's this space given for the music to have an impact. No, no, please. Ow, ow, please, ow, don't! You wanna fuck with what my brothers are saying? You wanna fuck with my family? He doesn't make the scaredy cat half measures that everyone else in town makes. Uh, which I think is a tragic mistake on their own part. Most people who make films are mixing movies with too many people in the room, 
uh, who are all going, ooh, did, did, a, did that line of dialogue get heard? And, you know, music gets turned down uh, unnecessarily. Paul wouldn't do that. They're so worried about people being distracted or losing attention that they make things that are fairly flat. <laughs> Paul's movies stand out because of his follow through. Where the fuck are you going? We know where you live. I was operating from a place that I massively dislike most soundtrack music, which I think has been an advantage for me. You know, I can come in and have something to react against. Every couple of weeks when he's editing, he says, you know, we should watch the whole movie, beginning to end. Doesn't matter how many times you've already seen it. Everybody gets very, very myopic, and it keeps him in the mind that people used to have to be in with films, which is, hey, what's important to the story? Oh. Guy who'd worked on tons of films was in visiting, and Paul played a big chunk. That guy stopped for a second and said, yeah, but, you know, is there a problem here with the narrative? almost seems like some of this doesn't add up or something. And I kid you not, because I sat next to him, and with the slightest bit of guile, he turned around and said, I know, isn't it great? If anyone else in town starts fucking doing that, maybe we'll have some movies to watch. <laughs>